Hey everyone, I already talked about the slash e degoogled Android ROM in a previous video, but there were some concerns about the look and feel, the security, where the APKs it installed came from, and how really degoogled it really was. And since the e-project has changed quite a bit since that last video, I think it's high time we make an updated one. So let's take a look right after this. This video is sponsored by Safing. They are an open source company that develops the Portmaster, an all-in-one network monitoring solution. It allows you to watch everything that comes in or out of your network and then block or allow the stuff you want to take action on globally or on a per app basis. Portmaster is free as in free beer and completely open source. And it also has advanced features like filter lists to automatically block ads, trackers or malware, and it can enforce secure DNS over TLS for your whole computer. All these features are easy to access thanks to a simple and legible user interface and you can download it as a deb or an arch package. It's also available on Windows if you need it there as well. Safing Sportmaster is still in alpha and looking for users and input. The team is super responsive and you can contact them by mail, on Reddit or directly on GitHub. Follow the link in the description to download Portmaster and give the team your thoughts. Okay, so one of the main comments I got on that previous video was that the slash e project was based on an old version of Android, namely Android 8 for my Galaxy S9 Plus. And for sure it wasn't the most recent version, but that has now been fixed for a lot of phones because a lot of them can now install the Android Q, so Android 10, based version of the slash e project. Now, flashing that new version though, is a different story altogether because the slash e installer doesn't allow to update from one version of, and of Android to another major version. So basically what you have to do is to install the stock firmware for Android 10, then flash TWRP for recovery, and then flash the slash e image for Android 10. There is no direct upgrade path from slash e version Android 8 to slash e version Android 10. That was a bit of a nightmare on my Samsung phone, but in the end it's done and I'll keep receiving updates based on that. And since Android 10 is the last version my S9 Plus will ever support, I shouldn't have to do this procedure ever again. But in the end, yeah, this is no longer an issue. You can move up to Android 10 at least and probably to Android 11 on newer smartphones as well. Now the second main problem I had with the slash e project was the look and feel. Some applications looked quite dated, they didn't look cohesive, the color schemes weren't the same, the button sizes, the look and feel. You all felt that it was a bunch of application forks that were just plugged in together without really thinking about a common design scheme or design theme. And basically that's what it was. Well, I can happily report that with versions 0.15 and 0.16, this is no longer the case. The default apps, which are forks of open source Android apps, now sport a nice white and blue color scheme, except for the email client and the Maps app, which haven't been updated yet. The navigation style still feels a bit different between apps. Some have tabs at the bottom, some have tabs on the top, but it still makes a big difference, and it's only the first step that Slash E is taking to unify the look and feel of the operating system. Now it's still missing a dark theme for now, which will probably annoy some of you, and if you weren't a fan of the iOS-like experience, it's not going to change, as the launcher hasn't changed, and the white and blue color scheme, if anything, makes the application look more like iOS than they used to. Now another really frequent comment I got on that previous Slash E video was that you were just moving away from giving your data to Google and giving it to the E Foundation instead. And this argument in itself wasn't really valid because, well, the E Foundation is a very small company and there isn't much they could do with the very small amount of data that they would gather if they did. But apart from that, it's not even true. First, the E account isn't mandatory. You can skip it, you don't have to use it. I personally don't use the E account that I could have created for free on that phone. I use my own Nextcloud server. You are not obligated to use that. It's just a nice bonus that the E Foundation wants to offer to users so they can have a complete, let's say, ecosystem of online services, an email address, tasks, calendar, email, contacts, etc integrated without having to use an account from a third party or from a big tech company. That's, that's the main goal. If you already have accounts that you like to use and that are already private, you can do so. Now the second point is that data that you're giving to E 
because you're storing your stuff on their cloud is encrypted so they have no access to it at least not in the plain old format they can't read your emails they can't read your contacts it's all encrypted out there and third the e-foundation doesn't sell ads they don't have an ad network or an ad platform so what would they do with that data if they collected it they they can't use it to sell personalized ads they can't sell it to anybody because it's encrypted there's not much they can do with it. So there's no reason to be afraid of using the eCloud account instead of a Google account because it's not the same size of companies and they don't have the same business model either. There's nothing they could do with this data if they wanted to. Now, speaking of that eCloud account, there was one limitation, which was you only had one gigabyte of free storage while creating that account and you didn't have really have any way to increase that. So basically this account was only suitable for very basic use. Well, now they have upgraded their storage pricing tiers, so you still only get one gigabyte for free, but you can get up to 20 gigabytes for two euros per month or one terabyte for 13 euros per month. It's still pricier than many alternatives. You traditionally can get up to two terabytes for 10 euros per month, but it's not horrible for a small company and you get, you get the privacy side of things that is really interesting in there. So the fact that it's a bit pricier isn't too bad. It, it costs less than what I have on my own Nextcloud server. Now, another really frequent comment I get is, why don't you just use Lineage with Micro G and you'll get the same experience as E with newer Android versions and better launchers, better stuff. And that's just not the same goal because while Lineage does remove some Google stuff from the Android open source project, it doesn't remove quite nearly as much as the slash e project does. Now first, Lineage still uses the Google DNS server, so basically every request you make to any server goes through the Google server so they can match your IP address to what you visited, so they can still completely track you while you use this. Now second, Lineage also uses the Google services to connect to captive portals, like for example airport or train station Wi-Fi's which means that if you use your phone to connect to any of those networks, Google knows where you were, what Wi-Fi you connected to, and also which websites you visited. And finally, Lineage also uses the Google services to aid GPS positioning, and they also use the Android open source uh, project WebView, which also calls into Google. Now the e-project removed that Google connectivity check, they changed the date and time servers to use the default internet date and time servers that everybody should be using instead of using Google's and why they can't change the DNS servers automatically because Android does that at first setup and there is no way to bypass that step, they added an option in the settings to let you change those after the fact. They should probably offer something after setup to do it automatically because that's probably the biggest intrusion that Google still has on the e-project and on the Android open source project. Now there's a handy PDF where you can find everything that the e-project removes from the Android open source project. I left a link in the description below if you want to take a look. So in short, Lineage is a pretty great project, but the slash e-project is really based on being de-googled, un-googled, and that's what they do, and they do it better than Lineage OS. Some people also pointed out that he stole code from Lineage OS, but Lineage is open source and slash he just forked it, which is a pretty basic and standard practice in the open source community. And they also mentioned that literally everywhere on the website and on the FAQ, just like they mentioned which apps they use to fork and make their own. So the practices here are extremely normal and there's nothing to say about those. So I don't know what this comment keeps popping up. Now, there were also a few recurring topics, uh, namely that the e-project pre-installed phones weren't available in the US and Canada. At the time of my previous video, that was the case. That isn't the case anymore. You can buy uh, phones pre-installed with the e-project on them. The selection is pretty limited. You'll only get the Galaxy S9 and the Galaxy S9 Plus, two refurbished models. They are not incredible value for the price, but they're still good phones, great cameras, great performance. They work really well and they will work with LTE, 4G, whatever you call that. So it's a proposition. Now you can buy them out there, which is something, I guess. Now there also was a security concern about the APK that you install through the eProject store. Because those APKs don't come from the Play Store, they are not vetted. So basically, where were they coming from and are they safe? 
Now the e-project uses the clean APK repositories to get their application and display them in the stores and install them. This is basically a complete mirror of, or well, almost complete mirror of the Google Play Store. It is pretty secure. And to let you check if a binary has been tampered with or not, you can check the SHA1 sum and compare it to the APK that you would download from the Play Store to check if it has been tampered with. It's not a super easy method. It's not foolproof or user proof in any way, but it's still something that you can use to check. And basically, you can expect that if users discovered that an APK from Clean APK had been tampered with, they would probably report it to the website that would change the APK. So it's not 100% safe. If you really want to be sure, you have to check basically every APK you install, but you can kind of trust that. Now, the e-project still isn't perfect. There are still some issues. And the main one is that you can't buy applications or pay for in-app purchases. There is no way from the e-app store to buy an application. All the applications displayed there are free because they don't use the Google Play services and as such you can't pay the developer for the application. This is not something I'm too scared or annoyed about because I don't generally use on Android any paid apps, but for people who like gaming, not having in-app purchases or not having paid apps is going to be a major deal breaker. They might resort to piracy, but that's not something I want to encourage and I don't think that's something you should do. So it's still a big limitation of the e-project and of most Google Android ROMs that don't use the Play Store. Of course, you could add the Play Store back to buy the games that you want, but that kind of defeats the purpose. Now, the last issues are probably more in terms of look and feel and user experience. The lack of Android gesture navigation is kind of inexcusable. They've been there for almost two years, maybe three years now. Not having them on the default launcher of the e-project is, is a big miss. It, it's, it's a big mistake. This is something that users are really expecting nowadays since the iPhone 10 and since Android 9, I think it was. Everybody's been using gestures. They are the default on almost every phone. Those capacitive buttons that are displayed on your screen might work for some people, but most people don't want that. So you really, really need to upgrade that launcher to support that. There's also the look and feel thing, which while the colors and the appearance of the various apps have been, has been tweaked and it does look more cohesive, in terms of navigation, those still don't look like applications made by the same manufacturer. The, the interface is much too different. Some have hamburger menus, some don't, some have tabs on the bottom, some have tabs on the top. Some are dark mode, some are not. It's, it's not coherent. It needs to change. It, it needs a cohesive design language. And it also needs a system-wide dark mode, which still doesn't exist on the e-project. I personally don't really care because dark mode hasn't been something I've found really super useful, but a lot of people seem to really, really like dark mode. And yeah, you, you really need to add that, guys. Now, apart from that, Slash E is still an amazing project, an amazing system, and it's probably the only thing I'd see myself using on an Android phone nowadays. I, there is no way I would go back to basic regular Android with all the data collection, all the sending to Google servers. I just couldn't see myself using that anymore. So yeah, it still exists. It has been updated quite a bit. It looks nicer. The roadmap is pretty interesting for the future. And I just debunked a bunch of myths that had been uh, added to the previous video. So if you hadn't checked the slash e project because you were afraid of some of those concerns, know that they are mostly alleviated or that they have been debunked. And if you didn't know about the project, don't hesitate to check it out or watch my previous video to learn more about it. So thank you guys for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, don't hesitate to like or dislike if you didn't. You can also subscribe and turn on notifications. And if you want to watch somewhere else than on YouTube, I'm also on Odyssey. I left a link in the description of the video. Now, if you really want to help support the channel, you can also join my amazing Patreon subscribers and YouTube members and get access to a weekly Patreon cast and the right to vote on the next topics I'll cover. Now, thank you guys for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.